when it's so weird when it's being filmed because the audience quite often has a lot more anxiety uh, than I do. <laughs> Uh, are you are you two a couple? Marvelous. You lo you look like a couple. I mean that as a compliment. Uh, how long have you two got left? <laughs> it's just a little joke. You don't need to answer. <laughs> Genuinely, uh, do you feel like sex is something that you do that enhances your? experience of reality or do you feel like sex and the the moment of ecstasy itself distances you from what you uh, perceive reality to be it doesn't matter um, <laughs> I've, I've got jokes as well that I can do so that's that's a good thing. I've got a joke about, uh, I've got some bits. Uh, uh, I want to be a bicycle hipster. That's one of my bits. Um, drinking enough water. You know when people tell you, like, health-wise, you know how much water you need to drink? And you go, what? That's so much water. How is there going to be time? So there's a few of you there that are really going to like that, I think. <laughs> Uh, privilege, that's not even a bit, that's just a reminder. <laughs> and a bit about how when I was 11, my mum told me I eat chicken fajitas as if I'm sucking cock. <laughs> and even at the time, I can remember feeling very sorry for my dad. Because <laughs> I was using a lot of teeth and I wasn't twisting my hands at all or any of that stuff. Poor dad. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much indeed for coming. Uh, I hope you're all feeling uh, well. I'm fine. Thank you very much for asking. I've got a bit of a dry cough and a temperature, but apart from that, I think I'll be fine. <laughs> I... Uh... I'm, I'm, I'm trying to raise my children gender neutral. Yeah. That usually gets quite a big well done in London, but never mind. <laughs> you do you, Glasgow. <laughs> I'm trying to raise my children gender neutral. My children, uh, they seem very, very keen on gender. <laughs> making it very hard for me to raise them as I would like, with my daughter constantly going, Daddy! Daddy! I want to be a princess! No, you don't! You want to be something healthy, like a seahorse or a door, okay? <laughs> I've given both of you nice gender-neutral names. Onyx and Anvil, will you listen to me? But Daddy! Daddy! Will you stop calling me Daddy? It is a gendered term. My name is Leader. I'm back together with the mother of my children. Yeah, it's a good sentence, isn't it? There's loads of info in it. <laughs> it took about three to five weeks of us being back together for her to start lobbying for a third child. Every single time we're out and about and there's a little newborn in a pram that gets pushed by, she starts tugging at my arm and going, I want one, I want one, I want one, I want one. What an acquisitional way to talk about human life. I want one. She goes, well, why don't you want one? And I go, because I'm not sure if I want one. And she says, well, if you're not sure if you want one, why don't we just go for it? People have children under that circumstance with that logic in mind. You'll speak to them and they'll go, we weren't really sure if we wanted kids, but we decided just to go for it. And it's not responded to as delinquent madness. <laughs> if somebody said to you, you know, I wasn't really sure if I wanted a face tattoo. <laughs> I decided just to go for it. And Upon reflection, it, it has actually closed more doors than it's opened. 
<clears throat> she goes, but you'll love it. If we have the baby, you know you'll love it, don't you? I know. That's why I don't want it. <laughs> love isn't a finite resource. I'm not going to run out of love. It's not coal or patience. I'm going to keep on making new love, depending on how many lovable things there are around me. That's just how love works. I would be much more keen on having a third child if I didn't have to love it. If you could come up to me and go, how are the kids? And I'd go, oh my God, Donnie's just started school and Margot's so sassy and uh, fucking what's his name is in the garden eating booze out of a fox's mouth. I think I don't care. I only ever wanted a dog. It's all I ever wanted. A little dog and all of the companionship, none of the anxiety, all of the love. Just have someone with you the whole time, a little dog, your friend. When you're watching a film, it comes and puts its jaw on your knee and goes, <laughs> you know? And if it dies, it's only a dog. <laughs> I'm not actually asked. It's not giving you any time off work because your dog's dead. I have to speak to my kids. There's responsibility in that. I have to speak to them. They ask me questions and my responses to their questions, they're important. They form who they become as people. That's a lot of pressure on me, you know? My kid, he came up to me the other day. He goes, Daddy, Daddy, what's opposite? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> to what? What? What are you talking about? <laughs> Just fuck off. You're being creepy again. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> strides up to me all confident the other day after watching Power Rangers and goes, Daddy, Daddy, why is my willy sticking up? <laughs> How do you responsibly answer that question? I just had to say, listen, I don't, I don't know, okay? It's a very, it's a very personal thing. I can't tell you why your willy is sticking up. I could tell you why one's willy might stick up, but I don't, I don't know, I can't. Mummy's wearing the strawberry dress again, that always does it for me. <laughs> Just before bedtime the other night, uh, he, he was looking out the window at the night sky, and he said, Daddy, Daddy, there's a new star in the sky. Did somebody die? He just went, yes. <laughs> Loads of people. Constantly. It never stops. <laughs> Boop. <laughs> As we were leaving nursery the other day, like a huge crowd of people like all streaming out of the nursery and holding hands with them, and he looked up at me and goes, Daddy, why does Yusuf's mummy wear a T-shirt on her head? Come here, please, come here, thank you, sorry. Come here, please, come here. Now, no, listen to me, listen to me. Listen, Yusuf's family believe that if we all saw Yusuf's mummy's hair, all of our willies would start sticking up. <laughs> and we wouldn't be able to get any work done. And I don't agree with them, but my God, do I respect them. <laughs> All stifling your laughter. It's on film, pigs. <laughs> People say that uh, parenting is a full-time job, and, and it isn't. Uh, it's, it's so much worse than that. If you were a recruitment agent trying to get people on board with the idea of being a parent, you'd be hard pressed to ever get anybody to agree to take the job. Hey, hey thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Uh, we've just had an opening in the role of uh, parent and we thought you'd be fantastic. Well, thank you so much for seeing me. Um, may I ask, uh, what, are the, what are the hours? Well, it's a, it's a full-time position. Right, I mean, I mean specifically, what are the, what are the hours? No, full, full time, all of your time, all time. <laughs> Forever, that's it now. Till you go, this is it. Full time. 
Uh -huh. and, so, and uh, can I ask, who would I be working for? Well, sociologically, that's actually a very interesting question. <laughs> I suppose you'd start off uh, working uh, directly for your partner, uh, your, the mother of your child, and then uh, after a few years, you and your partner both start working for the child itself. Uh, and then after many, many years, the child leaves home altogether and you both start working for your own uh, sense of powerless anxiety. <laughs> Fantastic, and uh, how much does it pay? It costs 17,000 pounds a year. And how do I apply for this position? You just have to come in her raw. <laughs> I'll apply tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Are their parents in? Yeah. 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 Uh, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Having to be somebody's co-parent and their lover having the, the person that you're co-parents with and the person that is your lover be the same person. It's a weird sort of thing to marry together, I think. And that's no more true for me. I know other parents in the room may have experienced this, the phenomena of going down on your partner in the same room as a baby monitor. It can take you out of it slightly, do you know what I mean? I, I'm a, a very big fan of oral sex. Uh, I like it. <laughs> I enjoy to receive oral sex. I think it feels very nice. Um, when somebody performs oral sex on me, I'm often thinking, yes. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, I, I, really, I think the reason why I like to receive uh, oral sex so much is because I, I love to orgasm and I love to be still. What an occasion. Uh, quite often the person who is performing oral sex on you will go, are you not enjoying it? Why are you not like, what, are you not enjoying it? Like, b b do something. No. <laughs> this bit is for me. I'm just gonna lie down, play dead, and then suddenly ejaculate. <laughs> Don't expect anything from me right now. Uh, I also love to perform oral sex. I've, I, I think that's quite good. I, I like to perform oral sex on uh, pe people, currently person, but broadly speaking, people. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've read literature on how to be good at performing oral sex, because that seems like a, a common courtesy. Uh, what you do, if you want to be good at oral sex, uh, if, is what you do is you just make a, your tongue fat. Uh -uh. <laughs> Get a fat tongue. Make tongue as fat as you can. Uh -uh. And then swipe up from the neck. <laughs> do that for a bit and then every so often just go across as a treat <laughs> that's not really what you do is it no. I made that up you're genuinely supposed to spell something apparently you? you really are you're supposed to spell something out on it you know pernicious I think that's the best word the best word you can spell on a is pernicious 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 gulag Pernicious, <laughs> that's usually an orgasm. <laughs> also, the good thing about going down on somebody who is your partner uh, or, 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 or your lover is that, you know, a regular partner is that you will learn when they're about to orgasm from their cues. They give you different sort of physical and maybe oral cues that let you know that they're about to orgasm, which is useful. So for me, I can tell when my partner's about to orgasm when she starts using the back of my arms like soap dispensers. <laughs> mm! Mm! <laughs> and when that happens, I can go, oh good, it's nearly done. <laughs> which isn't to say that I don't like it, I just am also glad when I've finished it. That's, I'm glad when it ends, but that doesn't mean that I don't enjoy the journey getting there. I don't want you to misunderstand, going, oh, I hate it, it's good, I like it, but also good, it's finished. You know, I wouldn't like football if there was never full time. <laughs> Make sense? Like my grandma often says she wishes she was dead, but that doesn't mean she wished she never lived. <laughs> anyway. Um, 
It's funny because most metaphors are reductive, but that one isn't. That's why that's funny. Um, so I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, performing uh, oral sex on her in the same room as a baby monitor. I'll be trying my best, uh, everything I've learnt, fat tongue, swipe up, uh, all of that stuff. I can do it for a while. Mm, nearly done, nearly done. Uh, and then suddenly on the baby monitor you'll hear, And she'll go, shh, 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 stop, 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 stop. <laughs> okay, carry on. <laughs> it's not carrying on, is it? We're at a different stage of the process now, aren't we? Is there anything more frustrating than your baby monitor ruining what's going on? It's like losing a saved game on PlayStation. <laughs> I've done this level before! <laughs> you know? I, I, a part of me misses being single. All the experiences you had when you were single, the fun of it. I, that's what I want. I want to be single. A big part of my identity is that. All the stories that you have. I went back to this girl's house once and she opened the door to her, her house and uh, she put her keys in a key bowl. Um, do you ever wonder what sort of person has a key bowl? A little bowl for the keys, what a thoughtful thing to do for your own house and what, what kind of person she was. It's not an amazing detail right now, but given what happened next, it becomes quite a good detail. Um, we were in a bed and we were having, what I don't mind telling you, was really quite bad sex. <laughs> And she stopped halfway through and looked at me in the eyes and went, piss in my cunt, Alfie. <laughs> yes, uh, no, I agree with you. I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked as well as you. We're all, we're all shocked. I haven't shocked you. We are all shocked at her. Boo! <laughs> piss in my cunt, Alfie. Al Do you ever hear your name in a new context? <laughs> Alfie. Is that me? I'm Alfie in this. I mean, there's not another, Al I'm Alfie. I said, well, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to go about pissing my... I want you to put your dick in me and piss. And I went, well, I, I'm, so I'm sorry to have to kind of be overly anatomical about this, but I can't put my dick in you without it being erect, and I can't piss without it being soft. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be a shit... I'm trying to problem solve here, but I don't know... <laughs> I don't know what you want me to do. I could, like, siphon it in, if you like, like a fuel thief. <laughs> Does that work for you still? <laughs> anyway, she said no, and I, 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 I left her flat. But as I left, I looked to my left and thought, what a bizarre person to have a key bowl. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I was in bed with a girl once, uh, really, there's nothing better than having a one-night stand and being in the sort of rosy-cheeked, sticky-skinned, lambent glow of fuck. Really good, enjoyable, panting, breathless, good, hearty energy gone into a good bit of fuck, you know? <laughs> Lovely experience, but of course, with a stranger can be a bit awkward, so we put some music on. Obviously, I'm a big musical theatre fan, um, so I put on my phone on Spotify, I got uh, the Beauty and the Beast soundtrack. Uh, 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 you'll be aware of the Beauty and the Beast soundtrack, track two, Bell, the big exposition number of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, there goes the baker with his bread like always. The shoe look but the so to so. Good morning, Bell. It's a great tune. Thank you, I don't need that, but thank you. Um, <laughs> and we, uh, we were listening to it, and as sort of relative strangers, we had this shared experience of hearing at about a minute and 30 seconds into this song, there is suggested or hinted to a subtext to Beauty and the Beast that is never remarked upon again, but is so much more harrowing than the story of Belle and the Beast itself. I don't know if you remember this bit in Beauty and the Beast. It goes, uh, Bonjour, hello, how is your family? Bonjour, good day, how is your wife? I need six eggs! There is somebody who needs six eggs! 
This isn't a case of wanting, for she fucking needs six. She needs six eggs, and nobody's doing fucking anything to help her. Bonjour, hello, how about... I need six! Why are you not listening to me? Stop fucking singing! Please! Help me! This is a need them! I need them! Bonjour, hello... I need... I need them! They've got my kids! They've got... I need six eggs! There must be more to this provincial town. <laughs> What a beautiful moment to share with a relative stranger. <laughs> and I love that. I love being single. But I just, I love Jesse more than I love being single. Huh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> There's not loads in it. <laughs> you know, there's enough. That's the way it should be, though. You should value being single, because then you know what choice you've made. You know, if your partner says to you something like, oh, thank God I'm not single anymore. Thank God I'm not single. I hated being single. It was the worst, wasn't it? All that going out, having to do stuff, meet people. Ugh, I hated being single, but now I've got you. Everything's different, isn't it? Don't have to do that anymore, because I've got you. If your partner says that to you, then who the fuck are you? <laughs> you could be anybody. <laughs> That's like somebody saying, oh, I hated drowning. <laughs> it was awful, wasn't it? All that water filling up inside my lungs and like slowly dying and not breathing. It was awful, but now I've got this sort of bit of old rotten wood that I'm clinging to for <laughs> dear life. That, in any other context I would ignore or, or actively hate. I, I'm so much better than drown. In the context of drowning, this is a brilliant bit of wood. Obviously, ideally, eventually, I'd like a boat. But, <laughs> but for now, this bit of wood. And that's what we've got. Like, me and Jesse want other things, but we want each other more than we want other things. And that's a good way to be. And she understands this about me. Every single time we're in a, like a bar or something, out for a drink together, and we see some couple across the bar about to embark upon a one-night stand, I just tug at her arm and I go, I want one! <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm lucky to have her. I think it's a good thing to weigh all that up. Lucky to have anybody, really alcoholic and got loads of debt. Anybody else got loads of debt? You got loads of debt? No? Nobody has any debt. <laughs> Fucking hell kind of place is this? <laughs> well, we don't go into debt here. It's just like only three pounds for a pint, so... <laughs> we've got no cause to go into debt, you see. Is that accent good enough to not be insulting? <laughs> it's not bad, is it? I, I love it up here. I think it's great. Whenever I'm up here, I always try and watch a bit of Scottish football. <laughs> and I just think, good for me. Um, see, it's good, isn't it? To, when you come up to Scotland, you should watch it. If you're not from Scotland, when you're up here, I know it's not on at the moment, but usually you should try and watch a bit of Scottish football. It's really sweet. It's really... <laughs> it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a student theatre. Go and watch it, you think. <laughs> Oh, good, they're really, they're having a go at that. It's, like, it's, like, it's, it's almost like they, they, they understand death of a salesman. Uh, but yeah, keep at it. It's like a homeless person passing the same five pound note back and forth to try and create the illusion of employment. <laughs> Nobody in debt, I'm in debt. Uh, I'm in debt to a debt collection agency. Uh, they text me. What a bizarrely intimate thing for your debt collection agency to do. They send me text messages, and the text messages go, Hi, Alfie. Hi. Hi. Hi, PRA Group Debt Collection Agency. Hi, Alfie. They go, we've just bought your debt from Lloyd's TSB. Go, what? That was, my, that was my debt. I would have sold you my debt. I need the money. 
uh, they really, really went for me a while back. And uh, I had really started calling me all the time, trying to get me to repay this debt. And I had to go to Dubai uh, to do some shows uh, quite quickly, uh, followed by L.A. Now, I don't know if anybody in the room has ever tried explaining to PRA Group Debt Collection Agency that you're currently unable to set up a repayment plan because you've got to go to Dubai immediately followed by L.A. Their sympathy can perish quite quickly. Also, Dubai and L.A. are very interesting places to go to back to back. Dubai and L.A., they're two manifestations of human ambition, but sort of that operate in the opposite way, as it were. Dubai is very honest with you, very much, here's my stuff, look at the huge building, have a bit of fun with that, isn't it massive? Have a look. It's very direct, very honest. Dubai is like a, a dick pic. <laughs> Whatever you think morally of the dick pic, there is no more honest form of communication <laughs> than the dick pic. Nobody ever looks at a dick pic and goes, wow, well, what, do you, what do you mean by that? <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? It's like a poem. It could be read in so many different ways. <laughs> Dubai is like uh, one of those rich kids at school who just wants you to come and play with it. Like, just desperate for any attention. Hey, if you wanted to visit Dubai, that'd be cool with me. We're not doing anything at the moment, so you could just come and visit Dubai if you wanted to. Just come and hang out. We built, like, I poured the water on the desert, so there's a beach there now, and <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's in the shape of a thing that you can only see it from a, a helicopter. So, you know, Dane, Dane Bowers is here. Um, <laughs> he, he's, D, he's DJing. We think, I think he's running away from something, but... Um, <laughs> But you could come anyway if you wanted to just come visit Dubai. That'd be okay. And like, the, the, you, could, you could drink. You could, you could drink if you want. I won't drink, but you could drink if you'd like. Uh, <laughs> the biggest, biggest building in the world. Biggest building in the world. We're actually building an even bigger building next to the biggest building in the world because we realised when you get to the top of the biggest building in the world, there's actually nothing to look at. So... <laughs> When I was in, in Dubai uh, with my driver, my driver, whilst in debt, PRA Group Debt Collections Agency, with my driver, um, and I said, who are they over there? And he said, well, sir, those are the slaves. And I went, ah, okay, that's actually a bit of a red line for me. Uh, I, I, I usually like to have quite an arm's length relationship with my slaves. Uh, I usually like to keep them in uh, Vietnam or China or something. And then if they just send me the stuff... <laughs> it's a lot easier for me to... I'm finding seeing the slaves a little bit much for me, actually. Dubai is very different. Dubai is all about you. It's not about the stuff there. It's about you, man. You can be whatever you want to be in L.A. In L.A., you can be whatever you want to be, as long as what you want to be is an actor or homeless. <laughs> or both. L.A. is like one of those performative male feminists. And I don't mean any man that identifies as a feminist. I mean those, like, performative woke bro feminists. Okay. Hey, man. I just believe in uh, treating women fairly. This is my thing. It's no big deal, apart from that it's huge. Uh, I just believe in treating women fairly, so, uh, you know, have, have at that what you will. I just believe in... I believe, yes, why do you keep on saying that? If I said to you, hey man, I'm not about to violently lash out. <laughs> would that make you feel more or less safe? I just believe in treating women fairly, man. Cool, man. I've never buried any of my enemies. We've always been great like this, you and me. I love us. <clears throat> uh, Dubai wants to show you its dick so that you'll see its love. And LA wants to show you its love so you'll stare at its dick. They're both morally bankrupt, and yet the debt collectors are after me. <laughs> I, uh... When we were in LA, I was with my whole family. We were, uh... We were with my whole family and we were in the car. It was me, uh, my girlfriend, my girlfriend's mother, 
my uh, two children and my girlfriend's sister, who I quite humorously refer to as my girlfriend-in-law. <laughs> yeah, it's a harmless joke behind which lurks the quite real desire to have sex with her. <laughs> and I, I think the real reason that I want to have sex with her so much is that I, I mustn't. <laughs> Whenever I see her, I go, God, if we fucked, it would just damage the whole fabric of our family life. So, so let's. <laughs> I think it's the reason that gay sex must be so hot in Pakistan. <laughs> I've never been to Pakistan, I've never had gay sex, but I can imagine it being a crossover event. <laughs> in the club. Hey, Bilal. You're looking good, man. No, not in a weird way. You just like your T-shirts. Nice little stitching kind of feature there. That's cool, mate. Yeah. Come, come here. I know I just want to whisper something into your ear. Come, come here. Come here. Whoa, Bilal. Come with me, Bilal. No, this is not, no, it's not weird. Not illegal. Not yet. Come here, man. Come here. Oh, my God. This, we should not be. Well, yeah, but we should. This could devastate. Every, this is fantastic. Bilal, sh hey, was that? Ooh, I hope the police aren't nearby, Bilal. Hope, did you just hear a Nino, Bilal? I mm, think I heard a Nino. Ah. Uh -huh. That's the sound of a predominantly white room uh, working out whether or not it's okay that I Google searched popular boys' names in Pakistan. <laughs> We, uh, we're in the car together, me and my whole family. Uh, my daughter has just discovered the humour in poo. I say discovered because it is there, it's present in poo. You might have uh, ceased to realise how funny poo is, but that doesn't mean that it itself has ceased to be funny, but more that you yourself have become weary. Uh, poo is an exceptionally funny thing, and my daughter has realised this. She calls everybody a poo. She goes, your poo-poo, your poo-poo. Your poo poo, she has a little song that she sings where she goes, Mummy does a poo and a wee and a fat and a fat and a fat and a very big fat. <laughs> and to be fair to her, I did write that. <laughs> and she's doing all of this in the back of the car. My girlfriend in law darts around her and goes, Margot, do not joke about poo poo. It's not funny and it's not ladylike. Now, funny one thing, ladylike. Do you kind of bristle at the word, use of the word ladylike? Quite narrow and turns gender into something sort of narrow and tyrannical. It's, it's prescriptive. And I think it's those prescriptive terms about how we behave in our sort of gender roles that mean that there's so much confusion about what that is at the moment. Without terms like ladylike and manly, maybe wouldn't be so much confusion about the nature of gender. You wouldn't have, you know, two toilets, one toilets for everybody and one unisex toilets with urinals, just in case you want to do a, a piss out of your gender neutral cock. <laughs> it's good that, isn't it? Because I start making one point and then I finish making another one. And you don't really know what I think and neither do I. <clears throat> I just don't, I don't really like it. Lady like it's, and it's, it's just a bit weird to, try and encourage half the globe's population to behave in such a kind of prescriptive, narrow way. More, more than half the population, isn't it? Isn't it? More than, women are more than half? Yeah. Why, does anybody know why that is? Why there's more women? No, nope. nobody knows. <laughs> I suppose there's a lot of pressure on you. It must be war, war's gotta be one. War? It's got to make a big difference. Drowning? Drowning's got to be one. Drowning strikes me as a very male way to die. Could only be a man that goes, yeah, I can make that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, she's in the back. She's not funny and it's not ladylike. Now, not funny. 
Poo is one of the most diverse comic utilities there is. Poo is an exceptionally funny thing. Poo is extremely... Br Humour exists in so many different ways. It exists in as incongruity, as satire, as humorous superiority. Poo can exist in all these different ways, and poo is one of the only things that it fits into every single one of these bands that humour can be. It's absolutely brilliant. Poo is, is incongruous, it comes out of your bum, and, and you must, you must do a poo. That's why it's so funny, is that you must. You don't have any choice in this, you have to do a poo. There's no, um, I, 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 will I do it? You will do a poo. So you have to feign that it's funny so as you have some control over your functions. Because if you actually had a choice over whether you pooed or not, it wouldn't be funny at all, would it? You have to do a poo. And it comes out whether you will it or not. The only reason that you do a poo is that you think, oh, I suppose a poo is coming out. It's the only reason that you do it. And it's a humour as, as, as satire of us, of our function. We are all excrement expelled from the bowels of somewhere, all billion-year-old carbon repurposed and reformed into something else at some point to become another thing. Humour as, as, as superiority. You're superior to yourself. You think, ah, ha, 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 ha. To think, 15 minutes ago, I had a poo in me. What a fool I was then. But now I am without. Ah, ha, 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 ha. What, a, what a nothing I was back then. Mummy does a poo-poo. Mummy does a poo-poo. Yes, Margot, yes. This is succinctly true and important. Mummy wins a South Bank Award, but ultimately, Mummy does a poo-poo. <laughs> we went to Comic-Con as a family. I don't know if you've ever been to a Comic-Con, but it's where people who are in Marvel Iron Fist or Harry Potter sign pictures of their face for a small fee. It's a wonderful day out. And uh, my girlfriend, the mother of my children, Jessie, she, uh, she goes to these Comic Cons, she works at them, she has to, because she was in uh, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Yeah, sure. I've never seen it, I've no interest. But uh, I believe it's the one where Harry gets sickle cell anemia. Which is, of course, rare if you are a white wizard. Uh, <laughs> she says to me, uh, oh, can you take the kids to uh, Comic-Con because I'd love for them to see everybody dressed up as superheroes. I think it'd be a fun day out for them. Uh, she's got to go off and do the stall early. I take them in uh, to town in the afternoon to go to the Comic-Con. I don't know if any of you have ever taken two toddlers on uh, a trip to Comic-Con before, but it is one of life's great fucks, uh, trying to wrangle them onto public transport, these death traps where they're absolutely determined to kill themselves and you've got to be responsible and try and go through the arduous process of keeping them alive when their willingness seems to be to do the opposite. And I'm hauling them onto this tube train and they're not grateful and Margot's just calling all the commuters a poo poo and Donnie's got his erection out and he's pressing it on the bars. And I'm just screaming into my palms, I wish you were both one dog. <laughs> and we get there and the queues outside the building are huge all full of these people in Spider-Man outfits which like without wanting to be uncharitable they have bodies that they're not Spider-Man's body you know it's <laughs> And most crowds are unified. They congeal together given a singular aim. And that aim is usually positive or aspirational. But the aim of the Comic-Con crowd is to be subordinate to something. And I began to feel just fucking disgusted with these people. <laughs> and I took my kids and I dropped them off at Comic-Con like the virgins they are. <laughs> But then I thought, am I really any better? I'm not any better than that. I go to Liverpool for the same reasons. I don't think I'm better than the Liverpool players. I go there for exactly the same reasons. And I love, I have an adult man's sense of love for Liverpool Football Club. And I love the city and the cultural history, the heritage, the people of the city. I love everything about it. And most of all, I crave the acceptance of Liverpool fans, but they won't because my accent is just too gorgeous. <laughs> the key moment of my Liverpool supporting life 
happened on the 22nd of February 2015. Uh, me and my brother met under the clock in Waterloo to take the train to Southampton, where Southampton would play Liverpool that afternoon. Uh, I sent him off to go and get the booze. I went to the toilet. He, even though he was underage at the time, is one of these people that has always been able to buy booze owing to the size of his head. Uh, people who work in off-licenses find it very unlikely that his head would have grown to that size <laughs> in just 17 years. We get onto the train and I go, open a beer, Sturridge is injured. What's gonna happen? Let's talk about it, let's get drunk. And he goes, Alfie, I've got to do some homework. And I go, well, let me help you with it and maybe we can get it done and start drinking sooner. And he goes, okay, it's about protest. It's a politics essay. And I go, okay, well, if you're gonna talk about protests, then you've got to talk about the crowd. And if you're gonna talk about the crowd, you've got to talk about the crowd's aims and the temporality or permanence of the crowd's aims being the linchpin on which the crowd either grows and uh, continues its existence or indeed uh, ceases. And that's where it all, that's why when you see people with picket signs, with signs like with political messages written on, they often say things kind of fluffy and meaningless like Tories out or austerity no. Because if they actually wrote anything on there that was achievable or meant anything, then it actually might happen. And then they'd have to stop hanging out with each other, which is actually what they want to do more than anything else. That's why we support football, because there's always a new aim. There's always a new place to go. There's always a, a, a new uniting thing to get behind. That's why Leicester City Football Club should no longer exist. <laughs> they should have won the league and then just ascended to heaven. <laughs> and this guy behind me, I can see him through the crack in the seats and he's laughing at me and Louis and the mere idea, the fact that people like us exist. And I go, hey man, do you want to have a beer? We've got some spare beers because Louis's not drinking his. If you want to come and talk about the game, he's still doing homework, so that'd be cool if you wanted to have a beer. And he goes, yeah, thanks very much indeed, that'd be sad. <laughs> I become quite starstruck because I realise that he is Scouse. <laughs> we have the whole journey just having a great time with each other. We have so much kind of a connection. We have the same level of football knowledge. I don't know if any of you like football, but when you're looking to make a new football friend, you need to make sure that you have the same level of knowledge as your football friend so that neither of you feels condescended to and you can both talk as if what you're saying is important, whereas actually everybody, when compared to football managers and people that work in football, know absolutely fucking shit. <laughs> So I'm going like, I love passing, isn't it great? And he goes, yes, I've been waiting ages for somebody to say that. And uh, we're talking for ages, we pull into Southampton Central and he goes, uh, so come on, man. Uh, you know, Sal, really nice to meet you. Uh, you know, a group of us are meeting around the corner from the ground. So uh, if you want to come and have a bevy with us, uh, that'd be cool with me, if you fancy it. Uh, so you want to come down, group of us. It's the Liverpool pub when we're away in Southampton. So if you wanted to come. I would love that. Thank you. Thank you. He goes off and gets us a taxi. I'm in Louis's ear going, do not fuck this up for us, okay? Do not fuck, just be cool. Be cool, okay? Do not fuck this up. Like we're about to be let onto P. Diddy's yacht. <laughs> We get there and everybody's so friendly. Everybody's so welcoming. Going, fucking hell, come on, man. I'm a baby show. What are you going to gain today, man? Yeah, fucking cool. I'm fucking love her, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you seem strong. You seem strong. Oh, you met Craig? Craig, come over here. Meeting new friends. Hey, come on, lad. And it is brilliant. These are proper scousers as well. Not fucking radio scouts. Hello, welcome to City Talk 96. Point. No, they're proper, <laughs> visceral, guttural scouts. It sounds like a Central African clicking language. <laughs> And well done me for understanding it, actually. <laughs> and none of them mention that we're Southern. <laughs> they all think it. <laughs> you can just see it register behind their eyes. Like, you know when you see an old person speak to a black guy? <laughs> You're black. Our mate from the train, Johnny, introduces us to his old best mate, Chris. These are the nicest, most welcoming, warm, 
energised people that I've ever met. So spiritually engaged with other people and non-judgmental. It feels fantastic. We get rounds in. We're very, very good like that. They get rounds in. We take strips off each other. It's really, really, really nice. And it's everything I've always wanted. Then Chris goes, come on, mum. We need to walk to the ground. We're going to beat the day in there. And then we start walking to the ground. When we're walking to the ground, they get out a little uh, bag of ecstasy. And they start <laughs> putting it down their throat, going, fucking hell, man. There's nothing better than when you take an ecchi and you're coming up just as the game starts and the songs move into the back of your mind and the green at the pitch starts to wave, man. Do you want an ecchi? Do you want an ecchi? And I said, thank you so much, but I won't. The offer alone was serotonin boost enough for me. <laughs> We get to the ground and I want to hug them goodbye and I want to exchange numbers, but the male emotional faculty doesn't tolerate too much exposure. So I move my shoulders at an angle towards him to suggest a hug, but I put my hand out as a buffer just in case it doesn't go my way. And we shake hands and we say, see you later, but I won't see them later because we're about to enter a little enclave of 4,000 people in a stadium of 28,000 people. Me and Louis walk into the ground. We walk up the concrete aisle staircase in the corner of the ground where they've put all the away fans. And we've got aisle seats, row M, which means minimum heads in the way of what you're doing. It means we've got aisle seats and we watch the teams warm up for a bit. I look across to the uh, far right uh, where the, uh, some of the Liverpool fans meet the police barricade and there are Southampton fans on the other side. And already some of the more uh, violently minded Liverpool fans are exchanging some ideas uh, <laughs> with some of the more violently minded Southampton fans going, Fuck it! Meet me outside, I will fucking end your life, love. I will fucking end your fucking look at me like that. All got hot dogs, freshly bought hot dogs in their hand, <laughs> waving out these hot dogs about like it's their dad's dick. Going, you love me one day, lad. Fucking meet me out. No, no, because I'm from another city, you see, and being from somewhere else is actually a big part of my identity. So it's making me fucking livid that you are from somewhere else. <laughs> Me and Louis watch that and think, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> and we watch, uh, we, uh, as row M continues, we've got our seats, and on the other side of the concrete staircase, row M continues, and we see Johnny and Chris bouncing down the aisle. <laughs> and they take the seats on the other side of the staircase. They're on row M aisle seats as well. By like chances of a thousand to one, we're sitting next to each other and there's no fucking shit handshake now. We embrace each other because the universe has allowed us some more time together, some closeness. These unlikely friends and unlikely friendship allowed to continue their journey together. It's absolutely fantastic and we hug and we're going yes and punching the sky, albeit they are absolutely chewing their lips off at this point. <laughs> but to me, it was a very real and human moment actually. <clears throat> we watch the game. Uh, we, we, uh, Philip Coutinho, he scores a long range uh, drive into the top corner of the goal. It uh, hits the crossbar and then thuds into the floor of the goal. And then that's the best goal. If you don't like football, that's the best one <laughs> that you can score. It was extra points good on that day because uh, when the ball hit the crossbar, it was raining. So raindrops fell like tears from God. <laughs> we didn't spend any time on our seats. We've spent the whole time on the concrete staircase. The whole time, just talking to each other, going, fucking, I told you earlier, passing, it's fantastic. <laughs> and we watch the game. And because we're standing on the staircase, the steward has to keep coming to tell us off. And he goes, uh, excuse me, excuse me, can you not stand on the staircase, please? Because actually, it's a fire hazard. So you need to take your seats, please. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. And Chris does this thing, which I think is quite a scouse thing, but I'm not sure, where he goes, no, you're right, thank no, 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 thank you for telling me that I'm in the wrong there. I'm in the wrong, fair play to you, man. Fair play to, I'm in the wrong, you're in the right. Thank you for telling me that I was in the wrong there. I'm gonna go take your seat now, man. Thank you very, have a nice day. Fair play to you, man. Fair play, no, you're doing your job. You're just doing your job, sound. Thanks very much indeed for telling me that I, in that instance, was in the wrong. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for taking me seat now. Cheers, pal, take care. <laughs> <laughs> we
we win 2-0. It looks like we're going to qualify for the Champions League. We don't, uh, but uh, there you are. We walk our, through Southampton, one of the worst cities uh, in, in, in England, I think. Um, <laughs> and we make our way back to Southampton Central train station. We've got beers from Sainsbury's and we board the train, but they've made loads of train cancellations and the train has fewer carriages than we thought we were originally going to get. So we're all cramped up. We can't move. We can't enjoy each other. We're almost too close. The crowd's too cramped to react to itself. So we're just there, face in face, can't open our beers. And Chris just cracks his head to the side slightly and looks through the glass door that separates the two carriages. And he sees through the glass door that first class is empty. And then he goes, Come on, lads! They can't arrest us all! They can't arrest us all! Come on! He starts dandying everybody into first class. And I'm right behind him going, Yes, actually, come on, could we? Thank you. <laughs> and we're in there. Louis got his laptop out again, taking a second pass at his homework, cut to death. I'm sitting next to some bloke who I don't know, but I want to get to know. I say, hey, did you enjoy the game? And he goes, yeah, it was sad. I go, um, brilliant. Did, did, do you live in, yeah, Liverpool, sad. Okay, cool. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and you, as, as you go to the game a lot, yeah, I'm a season ticket holder, yeah. Right, great. Um, and I had to say to him, I said, is something, is something wrong? Sorry. And he went, yeah, well, we didn't have people that sounded like you come in the game when I was a kid. <laughs> I know. I d uh, globally speaking, it's not an incredibly big problem, but <laughs> it did upset me personally. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay. But I, immediately I said to him, mate, I understand. I totally understand. It's, a big part of your life is Liverpool Football Club and a big part of your life is the city of Liverpool and those are intertwined and interwoven and you've grown up in Liverpool and seen what's happened and there's a lack of central government funding from London that causes a kind of siege mentality. Lots of the most brilliant and best cities get a lack of central government funding and it creates this civic identity that I think Liverpool thrives from but obviously it's very hard to enjoy those benefits when you're suffering from perhaps a lack of investment in services that you feel that should be there. Not only that but Liverpool's a port city, it's always had quite an outward looking uh, identity and been a cultural melting pot for other places and perhaps had less of an Anglic influence than a lot of other cities in the UK. So when you go to a Liverpool game, the sense of community and the sense of uh, being somewhere where you feel recognised and seen and like you are with your people, that's important to you and the accent's a big part of that. So I understand that when you hear an accent like mine, a place where you go to feel connected to something, it can feel alienating at exactly the point that you wish not to feel alienated. So I get it. I get it. I suppose also when you were a kid, you wouldn't have had Felipe Coutinho Correra scoring a goal either, would you? But... <laughs> I suppose that's the thing with globalization. You've really got to take the rough with the smooth. <laughs> and uh, just then the ticket inspector comes in and goes, excuse me, have you all got your first class tickets? And Chris goes, no, you're right, I'm sorry. <laughs> but obviously we're not going fucking anywhere. <laughs> I love it, I love being part of a crowd. I love the feeling and the, the sense of being, I love all of that, but I'm deeply suspicious of it. The drive of group identity will most often be superior to individual rationality and that's what needs to be warned against, whether you're at a Comic-Con or a Liverpool game, whether you, whatever, it's always there. And that's something that Jordan Peterson has put very succinctly in many different lectures, in many different debates. He has always warned of the pernicious influence of group identity on our society and the fact that when we see or um, are visited by group identity as a force in our society, we are to warn it off, to get it away and to resist group identity in all its forms. And group identity, Dr. Jordan Peterson has described as such an awful thing so many times that he's actually managed to forge one of the strongest group identities there is <laughs> around exactly that idea. Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-racist. 
He's been searching for racism his whole life, searching for the cause of racism in our society and trying to weed racism out wherever he can, looking for the source of racism, looking to end racism at the source. And Jeremy Corbyn, in his infinite wisdom, has come to the conclusion that racism can only be the fault of the Jews. <laughs> Um, now that's, uh, it's, that's quite a similar joke twice, isn't it, with different characters. And my job as a room distilling comedian is to get rid of everybody who reacted angrily to either joke. And my dream, to be honest, is to come back here next year with a smaller and better crowd. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, thank you. Thank you very much! Thank you so much, cheers. I, uh, I hope you all have nice lives and, uh, and uh, you all get what you're looking for and uh, that everything uh, goes your way. Uh, my name's Alfie Brown. Uh, thanks very much indeed again, bye-bye. Thank you very much.